The story opens as first chair violinist Malcolm Hartwell plays with great focus during a concert, until blood from his fingers causes him to falter. The camera pans to the audience where a rich real estate investor, Gavin Doran, and his wife, Olivia don't seem to be surprised at the subpar performance. After the concert, an incredibly nervous Malcolm rushes back to his apartment at 999 Park Avenue. The historical New York building he lives in, known as the Drake, is currently owned by Gavin. Inside his room, Malcolm smashes his violin and quickly packs his suitcase. He is looking to escape and leave this life behind. Unfortunately for him, escape is not really an option when you live at a place like the Drake. It is revealed that 10 years ago, Malcolm wasn't a very talented violinist. He then signed a binding contract with the devil, putting his soul in exchange for success. The devil is none other than Gavin Doran who now lets Malcolm know the deal is over. The scared violinist tries to escape into the streets of New York only to get sucked back inside the Drake. The next morning, a beautiful young woman named Jane Van Veen and her boyfriend, Henry Martin, interview for the resident manager's position at the Drake. She's an aspiring architect while he's one of the high-ranking law consultants in the mayor's office. Jane's expertise about the building's history helps the two of them get the job. Then, Dorman Tony DeMio, who is the eyes and ears of the Drake, shows them to their luxurious new apartment. It's a place that belonged to the previous manager, Malcolm Hartwell. Elsewhere in the same building, Brian Leonard, an aspiring playwright, is struggling to get past page one on his latest work titled Disappearing Inc. He's distracted by this beautiful blonde woman he sees undressing in the building across the street. He sneaks a peek without getting caught by his wife, Louise who is a rising star in the world of fashion photography. Louise, on the other hand, is having a meltdown about her assistant quitting just before a big shoot. Brian comforts her but his eyes stroll back to the girl across the street. However, the hot blonde notices him glancing towards her direction. Later that night, Jane runs into another resident, 16-year-old Nana Clark, who informs her there's a thief in the building. Jane thanks her for the information and goes to the basement where she fixes a flickering light bulb. Unbeknownst to her, the figure of a ghostly pale woman in a long, white nightgown stands right behind her. By the time Jane fixes the light, the mysterious woman is gone. Jane continues to look around the basement and finds a mosaic on the floor that looks like a dragon. A few nights later, Jane has a rendezvous with another tenant named John Barlow whose right hand is covered with blood. She later tells this to her boyfriend who informs her that the guy's wife, Mary Barlow, died recently. The scene shifts to John's apartment where it is revealed that the blood on his hands isn't his own. He actually murdered a judge as part of a deal he made with Gavin, the devil. As a part of their agreement, John finds his wife Mary, who is now resurrected, quietly sitting on his bed. She looks lost, but appears to be very much alive. The following afternoon, Gavin asks Henry to join him at a nearby golf range. There, they have a conversation with an investor named Daniel Stone. He is irked that Gavin is messing up his real estate venture in Brooklyn. Suddenly, Henry remembers that the place he works in, the mayor's office, is involved in a legal dispute with the property. This makes it improper for him to have any contact with the investor Daniel. He, however, brushes it off believing that the whole meeting was a coincidence. Little does he know that Gavin is pulling all the strings around him. In the meantime, Jane does some research on the Drake to find that Mary Barlow jumped to her death from the roof of the building. Speaking of Mary, she might be alive but does not look or feel healthy. John then calls Gavin and begs him to heal his wife completely. But the devil has his own plans. He tells John to kill Daniel Stone in exchange for his wish. This is something he can't do again. That very evening, Olivia has a pricey red dress delivered to Jane's apartment. The duo then attend the black tie event with Gavin and Olivia. But, back at the Drake, Nana breaks into the young couple's apartment and steals Jane's necklace. It is obvious that Nana desires the necklace not for monetary gains, but for some greater purpose. On the other hand, Louise finds a new assistant for her shoot in record time. Her name is Alexis Bloom. The mystery blonde her husband has been spying on from behind his laptop screen. Alexis seems to relish the fact that her boss's hubby enjoys watching her undress. Only a few minutes later, as Louise attempts to step out of the building's elevator, the door violently and repeatedly closes on her. She gets seriously injured by this strange occurrence, while her husband is forced to watch helplessly. Similarly, bad luck also strikes John Barlow as he wakes up suddenly to find Gavin seated at the foot of his bed. The devil informs that Mary is going back to where she belongs. Then, John is lifted in the air and thrown into the bedroom wall. The building seems to consume him until he is completely gone. A few floors downstairs, Jane awakens, absolutely sure that she heard a big thumping sound. She goes out to the lobby and sees a mysterious woman headed towards the staircase. Jane follows her down the winding emergency staircase, 
and ends up in the basement. To her surprise, the dragon mosaic on the floor is clear and clean now. Nearby is also a door that she hadn't noticed previously. Jane opens the door and magically arrives atop the roof of the drake. She notices Mary Barlow, dressed in all white, stepping over to the ledge. Mary turns around and warns Jane that she shouldn't have come to this building before jumping off. Just before she crashes to the ground, Jane wakes up in her bed. She is disturbed but breathes a sigh of relief that it was just a dream. However, as the camera pans down, Jane's feet are dirty as if she had just walked outside barefoot. A few days later, Gavin meets with Henry and Jane so that they can sign their employment contracts. He also wants Jane to help restore the drake to its original glory. Jane is thrilled at the opportunity, as she and Henry gladly sign their contracts. Elsewhere in the building, Nana clutches Jane's necklace and channels some kind of second sight using it. The vision she has is a scary one. She sees a horror-struck Jane gagged and bound in a chair in her beautiful red dress. The next morning, Jane is inspecting the newly vacated apartment of John Barlow. She hears strange scratching noises coming from behind the bedroom's wall and peels back the wallpaper. Suddenly, a black starling darts out of the small opening. Hundreds more such birds soon follow suit and burst into the room. In a blink of an eye, the birds crash out through the window and circle the drake. Meanwhile, Jane and Henry are invited to a house party at the penthouse of the Dorans. There, Henry comes across a scale model of a tall skyscraper in the study room. Turns out, Gavin is buying the construction project from a company called the Alpern Development Group for a whooping $100 million. After the party, Jane heads down to the basement to collect some clothes she left in the dryer. A black starling fluttering across the basement draws her attention towards the mysterious door that she saw in a nightmare last night. Jane steps through it only to find a man laying down on the floor of an apartment in a pool of blood. Without any warning, the dead man's eyes open suddenly, and a startled Jane wakes suddenly in the comfort of her own bed. This is the second nightmare she has had in the span of two days. However, lying near her bed is her laundry basket filled with clothes from the dryer. A few days later, Jane learns that there are hundreds of starling birds living inside a shaft in this apartment building. She calls in an exterminator who promises to kill them all. Jane also wants to check if the mystery door from her nightmares actually exists and makes the guy break down a basement wall just to be sure about it. In a shocking event, the exterminator is killed by a group of starlings later that night. In the meantime, Jane finds an envelope slipped through her apartment's door. It holds an article detailing a murder that occurred at the Drake back in 1956. The victim is the same man that Jane saw in her dream a few days ago. The article also mentions that the killer was never caught. When her boyfriend returns from work, Jane shares this information with him. But, Henry has his own troubling news. He came to know drama's work that the skyscraper that Gavin is about to buy is built on a wasteland. He is about to lose $100 million buying out that project. But, Henry can't reveal this information to Gavin as this is inside information. Things only get more awkward as the Dorans are about to visit their apartment later that night for dinner. Elsewhere in an upscale restaurant, Danielle, a resident of the Drake, runs into Gavin. The real estate investor introduces her to his friend Frank Alpern, the same man who just sold the $100 million skyscraper project to Gavin. Danielle ends up going on a date with Frank and in a drunken stupor, they eventually get intimate in her bedroom. After their passionate lovemaking session, Frank shows his true colors. He casually tells Danielle that he's married and whatever happened between them is just a one-night stand. The poor woman is crushed by this revelation. Downstairs, Gavin and Olivia show up for dinner at Henry's apartment. They eat and have a conversation during which Jane brings out the topic of the 1956 murder that occurred at the Drake. As it turns out, the man was killed in the apartment that currently belongs to Danielle. Right on cue, Jane has another dream about the murdered man later that night. This time, however, she sees a 1950s version of Danielle holding a bloody knife in the room. The scene then quickly shifts to a confused and devastated Danielle holding a knife over the dead body of Frank Alpern. She tries to make sense of what is happening when Gavin arrives in the room. He seems unusually calm despite seeing a man lying in a pool of blood right in front of him. This is when the web of Gavin's devilish powers are revealed. Turns out, he wanted Frank dead after the latter had knowingly sold him the skyscraper built on a wasteland. So, Gavin had manipulated poor Danielle into going on a date with Frank and eventually murdering him. It is also revealed that this isn't the first time he has done so. In fact, Danielle is actually a 90-year-old woman who gave Gavin her soul in return for eternal youth. Ever since, the devil has used her to kill several rivals who have crossed him in business. This includes the 1956 murder which Jane was talking about earlier. Every time Danielle murders someone for Gavin, 
He wipes her memories to make Dot her a brand new woman. Elsewhere, Alexis lets herself into Brian's apartment just as he's getting out of the shower. He asks her to leave, but doesn't stop her from kissing him as he stands dripping wet in just a towel. A few days later, Louise later returns home from the hospital and finds a pleasant surprise. Apparently, Gavin has sent them a check for $300,000 as a form of compensation for her injuries. The following morning, Gavin has a conversation with Henry while the latter is headed to work. The rich real estate investor says he's impressed at the integrity Henry showed in not disclosing his knowledge of the Alpern deal. Gavin also adds that he was able to immediately sell the property to a Chinese businessman and make a monster profit. Shortly afterwards, Gavin tells Jane that there's no need to worry about the Starlings as he doesn't want them to be exterminated. He also asks Jane to head towards the basement to check out the progress with the wall she had ordered to be broken down. Upon reaching the basement, she sees the wall has been partially demolished and right behind is the door from her dream. Jane steps inside only to have it slam shut behind her. She is now trapped in the creepy basement side room and she's not alone. There's a collection of old dolls scattered amongst the cobwebs all around her. Whispers of let us out can be heard just as a little girl grabs at Jane's leg. Fortunately, Henry arrives and opens the door just in time to save his girlfriend. She is extremely spooked out and is more than happy to head back upstairs. Unbeknownst to them, a frightened young girl clutching one of those tattered old dolls has also come out of the side room. Following this creepy incident, Jane goes to meet Gavin and asks if he could give her the original building plans. She wants to dig deeper into the mystery behind the room she found, not to mention everything else about the Drake. Gavin agrees to do as long as she does him the favor of keeping Olivia occupied for the afternoon. Today is a difficult day for the both of them as it's the 10th anniversary of the death of their daughter, Sasha. Thus, as a part of the deal Jane goes to lunch with Olivia, where she admits to having some weird visions lately. They also end up talking about Sasha's death, clearly a touchy subject for the mother. But Olivia seems to have her own way of dealing with the loss. After the dinner, Olivia speeds down the road where her daughter died in a car accident while Jane is in the passenger's seat. Olivia stops the car a few feet away from a road divider and reveals that it wasn't really an accident. She says Sasha wanted to end her life and crashed into a concrete wall on purpose. Meanwhile, Gavin takes Henry to an upscale restaurant where they see Bill Edwards, a city councilman who is gearing up for a run to be mayor of New York. Gavin knows the councilman is looking for a chief of staff for the election campaign. So, he encourages Henry to approach Bill right there and grab the job. The aspiring lawyer takes his shot and to his surprise, ends up with a tentative job offer. The scene shifts to Annie Morgan, another tenant at the Drake who is a passionate, motivated journalist. But, she has been saddled in a boring job of writing obituaries for the local paper. One morning, Gavin meets Annie in the elevator and encourages her to tap into her creativity. Energized by this, Annie later makes up a fake story about a recently deceased man. She falsely dubs him to be a covert CIA operative who once tracked a vicious KGB enforcer named Kandinsky. When Annie reaches work the next day, she's shocked to learn that her article has struck a nerve with the public. The man whose obituary she wrote is now believed to be an American hero. Annie suddenly becomes a star reporter at the paper. Bolstered by this sudden success, she revises her own mother's obituary and makes her out to be a top-selling children's author. She's also asked to do a follow-up piece on the elusive KGB operative Kandinsky. That night, Annie concocts a chilling story about this fictional fellow, Kandinsky. She writes down that he had a specific handbag that he used to store equipment for his torture sessions. Just like her last fake story, this one also becomes reality. Unfortunately for Annie, a scary man who looks exactly like the person she described in her story suddenly arrives at her front door. He breaks in, ties her up and prepares to inflict some of the same torture Annie just wrote about. In the Doran penthouse, Gavin meets with Bill Edwards and the two men have a conversation. The real estate investor wants the councilman to help him get a shady property. But, Edwards doesn't want to play along with the plan and even refuses to accept any bribes. Eventually, a murderous Gavin pushes Bill down the elevator shaft from his penthouse. Late that night, the evil real estate investor tells Henry that perhaps a job with the councilman isn't the best career move. Gavin then manipulates Henry to shoot for loftier goals, like running for a council chair himself. At the same, Olivia sits by the Hudson River and burns the suicide note her daughter left 10 years ago. Its contents aren't clear but the words he's evil can be clearly seen in the center of the letter. In the meantime, Jane is heading towards her apartment when she sees the little girl with the doll in the hallway. The kid ominously says, don't let him out, before vanishing into thin air. A confused Jane tries to ignore this, thinking that her brain is playing tricks on her. However, later that night, she hears a jingling sound coming from the air vent in her apartment. She knows the vent is connected to the basement, 
and heads down there once again. The sound seems to be coming from the handle of a dirty old locked suitcase. Jane then drags it up to her apartment but leaves it as it is for the time being. As she heads to bed, a creepy hand starts pushing out from inside the suitcase. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification, and leave 1000 likes or 100 comments if you'd like us to continue part 2. Thank you.